The title of the message tonight is Best Dad Ever, Best Dad Ever, Best Dad Ever, three times. That's, I said I think I was going to go with that title for every sermon for the rest of my life. I like it. Um, we talked about that last week, that we are in a war. It's a spiritual war. Uh, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They're not of this world, but they're mighty through God. And what they allow us to do is they allow us to pull down these strongholds in our life and to cast down every thought and every imagination that tries to exalt itself above the knowledge of God. So that led us to believe and understand that this, this war that we're in is it's in our mind. It's where our imagination is. It's where our thoughts are. Right? So the battle's between our ears. And everything in this world, um, just go to get up out of bed and go to work and go here and there and watch the news, and everything you know in this world is opposed pretty much to God and to faith. And the Bible tells us that the message of the cross to those who are perishing is foolishness. Right? They think it's craziness. But it says, but to us who are being saved, it is the power. So that is the message of the cross is, is there's power there. And we're talking about love and compassion. And, and I firmly believe that if we're going to be successful in our mission and our destiny in life, if we don't understand that we have the best dad ever, if we don't understand this love of God, we're most likely going to give up when it gets hard. But if we truly understand the Lord and who he is and his love for us, I said last week that a lover will always outwork a worker because a lover will never give up. A lover will die for what they love. If you feel like you're just a worker, you when it gets tough and you just feel like you're following rules and regulations, you're, gonna, you're probably going to get burnt out and you're going to give up. So that we need to really look in deep into this love of God thing. More than just, you know, what he was saying is about feeling good about yourself. I mean, if you understand the love of God, you will feel good about yourself. That just comes right along with it. But I want to go even deeper and say, we have to know this burning heart of the Father if we're gonna, if we're gonna um, fulfill what we're called to do, I, I believe that with everything in me. So, I'll just tell you a little bit about kind of what's going on inside of me, so you get an understand of understanding of why I talk the way that I do. Um, more and more, I'm reading the Word, and the the people in the Bible are becoming more and more real to me. Um, they're not, I don't like to call them Bible characters. It kind of makes it sound like they're, they're made up. And they're they're make-believe that, you know, Noah was a person. He, he was alive. He's, he's our brother. He was on that ark. That ark was real. Um, the flood really came. And um, I want to look, look at his life and understand that this brother was told by the Lord that a flood was coming that was going to destroy the entire earth. Um, if you think about that and you take it personally, you know, and it doesn't be, it's not a story to you, but it's real, and you say this brother was real, and you can try to imagine yourself in his shoes, what would it be like? And the Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness. So he was preaching. He was telling people about the Lord. And this is just my opinion. This isn't scripture, but I, I think that the, the, one of the reasons that ark was so big was 
I think the Lord wanted some people to get on it too. I think because he was, he was, if he was calling him to be a preacher, he was preaching. And nobody, nobody got on. Nobody listened to him. And if you take that and you listen to it, that must, it wasn't always an easy life. And I, I don't believe that we're called either to an easy, just an easy life. I think following God, I think it, some people have sensationalized it and made it sound like you just follow God and you never have any problems and you're just on easy street. And it's, no, I've encountered, my experience is um, we have the Lord. <laughs> He's the hope of glory in us. But there's still really, really hard things that we have to deal with. The only difference is now we have the greater one inside of us. And we need to understand the love of God. And also, too, in our kind of our fast food society in America, we all want to feel, we want, to know, we want the love of God to increase in us. And we want to feel the power of it. And... Um, but what we, some of us want to do is we, we want to just come to a worship service and have somebody pray for us and get this love imparted to us. You know, it's like, come on, Brother Robert, just pray for me. You sound like you feel you know, you're on fire for the Lord. You know the love of God. Just lay your hands on me and pray for me. And what I'm saying is that how we're going to grow in this revelation of, of the love of God is not by people laying hands on us. It's going to be by growing in it day by day, inch by inch, reading His Word and talking to Jesus. Having the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, little by little touch our heart. Not just this instant download of the love of God where all of a sudden we just know it. We need to grow deep into his heart. And we must pray the prayers of the apostles that went before us. I want to take, we talked a term about 18-inch journey. We want to take an 18-inch journey to take the, the stuff we know about God that's in our brain and our mind and take it down into our heart. So let, man, let's just pray for a hunger and a thirst for the Lord to, just to arise in our heart. We need, we need to earnestly pray the scriptures and just to capture his heart. To know, you know, Paul prayed, he wanted to know. He said, I want to know the love of God, the length, the depth, the width, the height, to know the love that passes all knowledge. Paul prayed that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, and if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then he goes on to say, you know, that we need to leave our past behind us. He says, not that I have already obtained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay, a hold, lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward to the goal of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. I think our, our relationship with the Lord, it, it's... It's like, it's like every other relationship in our life. It takes time to develop. Trust, right? When you just meet me, do you trust me instantly, right away, without knowing me? Would you, you know? You'd be like, hey, I don't know you, you know? And it's the same with the Lord. He calls us into a relationship with Him. And as we walk with Him, as we ourselves find Him faithful, we begin to trust him more. 
Uh, as we go through difficult seasons and difficult situations in our life, that's what forges our relationship with the Lord. We go through a difficult time and we say, we come out of that season and we say, wow, God was so good to me. That was a, that was the toughest season of my life, but I'm, but I'm thankful for it. God was with me the whole way. And these things don't happen be, just because someone lays hands on you. And so, if I could do that, I would just do that. I would just lay hands on you. You'd have it. You would get it. But understanding the love of God comes from a pursuit of Him. And our private life with God, there's no substitute for that. There's no substitute for, you know, continuing on and praying and and seeking His face through hard times. And he wants us to do this. He wants us to see. He wants to prove himself faithful to us. In Hebrews 6.11 it says, he's telling us this, he says, so that we don't become sluggish, that we need to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So it's through faith and patience that we're going to inherit the promises of God. And patience, what patience is, it's not, patience is more of an attitude. It's, it's while you're waiting, what, what's going on in your heart. I mean, I could be standing in line at the store, and I'm going to be waiting in that line for five minutes, you know. And I could be sitting there, standing there in line, and just, you know, tapping my foot, and just, you know, all in a hurry up in my mind and I have so much anxiety and stress. Or I could just stand there and have peace in my heart and know that that line is not going to move any faster, whether I'm anxious or not. And the only difference between the two situations is in my mind, in my, in my thoughts, I was at rest. Nothing, nothing else was different. And patience is... We're believing the Lord that He is doing a work. We're not getting stressed out and anxious when we don't see, when God's not moving the way that we want Him to. And I, we talked about this last week too. So why do people go just only so far with God and then they stop? And it's because the battle that we're in is real. It's a real battle, and the road is hard. It's a straight and narrow path. But God promises us that if we lose our life for his sake, that we'll find it. And I want, to, I want you guys to turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 11 in verse 13. It, it lists, in the, in the book of Hebrews, it's known as a faith chapter. And it lists, you know, some people call it the Hall of Fame of faith. It lists our heroes of the faith, such as, you know, there was Cain and Abel. Abel was one of the heroes of the faith. And Enoch and Noah, which we mentioned, and Abraham. And Sarah, his wife Sarah, she received strength to conceive a child in her old age. It talks about Joseph and Moses, Rahab, Gideon. David, these were great men and great women of faith. If you look in verse 13, it says, all, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises. I thought, first time I ever read that, years and years ago, I thought, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't like that. I didn't like reading that. It says, They died in faith, not having received the promises. And as I, you know, learned a little bit more, let's read it. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. They embraced them, and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The vision and the plan and the promises that God had for their life are taking place even right now. God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. And he never saw that in his lifetime. He died 
not, it says, he died not receiving that promise while he was here. But he did receive that promise. And he is the father of many nations and to this day. And his children are as numbered as the sand of the sea. And we have been grafted in to that. And it says they embraced and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And as we go further with the Lord, you know, there's going to be things that happen in our life where the closer and closer you get to the Lord, you're going to start to feel more and more like you're, you know, an alien on this earth because the things of God are so, are <laughs> so different than the things which we see with our eyes. Um, I'm having, a, I'm having a, a lot of difficulty tonight explaining because I have so much going on in my heart and I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble finding language for it. So just be patient with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it out eventually. But You know, a five-week course about the love of God is... Uh, not going to produce the fruit that, you know, I would love to see. You know, it takes, it's going to take a lifetime of pursuit, passion, seeking the Lord. And what, what I hope to do tonight and in the series that is just to let your, get your appetite stirred up. To stir you up for a life of passionate pursuit of Him. It doesn't, it can't, it doesn't all happen in one day. And when I was a young Christian, I would, I would sit and I would listen to uh, teachers and preachers. And I was sitting there and, and I was so on fire for the Lord, but I didn't have a whole lot of understanding. And I would think, why don't they just say this? And why don't they just say that? You know, and I had all these things going on in my heart. If they just said this and they just said that, you know, the people would get it and the people would grab it and they would understand and then as I was hanging around, I would hear the preachers preach these same messages that were going on in my heart. And they would preach them with better clarity than I could do, you know. And, and they, were, they were more gifted than I was. And, and they were powerful messages. And yet I, was, I would look out and I would see it wasn't having the effect <laughs> that, I, that I would wanted it to have. And I, I said to myself, wow. It's all about having an appetite. It's all about having a hunger and a thirst. When we come into a service, if we're hungry for God, if we're really thirsting for God, we can hear one or two things, <laughs> and they, could, they can change the course of our life. Um, I've talked about this before. I can tell people who are hungry for the Lord just by watching them in worship. I can tell when somebody went to a conference on a Thursday or a Friday by watching them on Sunday and their pursuit and worship is different. And um, we come in and we're hungry for God. It doesn't much matter how, much, how good the music sounds. It's about Jesus and it's about going for it with, for Him. And the Lord is stirring my heart in this last, I would say, month and a half to the point where I'm just, I'm absolutely consumed with the things of the Lord. I'm absolutely, my, my brain and my spirit is just constantly thinking and thinking about the kingdom and, and my life and how I can um, truly be a man of God. And I'm, I'm praying things like, Lord, I just, just show me what it, what it looks like to be a man of God. Just show me what it looks like on a daily basis. Just show me what this looks like. I want to follow you. And that's the type of stuff that I want to impart to you. I don't, I don't even know how to do it, except explain to you what's going on in my heart. Um, I talked with Pastor Bob yesterday after work, and it was just like he, he was talking and he was saying, I said, how are you doing? He said he was just thinking about revival. He was thinking about souls being saved. He, he was consumed. And I said, oh, Pastor, it's so great to talk to you. And to hear, just to hear, I know that we're not the only two, 
but that's the only, he's the only person I was talking to. I said, it's just so awesome to hear somebody else is just having these same thoughts and just being consumed with them at the same time. And um, we had, we had this, a great conversation, and I'm just trusting now as I'm talking that the Lord is doing something in your heart. I said, all these, they died in faith. Not having received the promises. And another place in Hebrews, it talks about there's a great cloud of witnesses. People that have died before us. And, you know, if you were sowing your entire life into something, and you died, and you were in heaven, you wouldn't you be interested in how it turned out? You know, that pursuit? Like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and all these guys... They sowed their entire life into the kingdom. You know, and then you have people in the New Testament, the, you know, the apostles and, and Paul and Stephen, the martyr who, who laid his whole life down for everything. It's like they're not just up in heaven not going, huh, I wonder what's happening down there on earth. They're, they're, they're really interested in, in how things are playing out. And my prayer for us is that as we read the Bible it just becomes alive and alive and alive more and more. We understand these people are real. They're not, they're not just characters in a story. We talked about, in the last four weeks, we talked about love being the more excellent way. He talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. It's talking about spiritual gifts. And that word gifts is not, you know, it's italicized in the Bible. It's not the word gifts isn't in there. He's, he said concerning spirituals, basically he's just talking us, to us about how, what it looks like to be a spiritual person. He talks about the gifts of the Spirit, how the Lord gifts us with different, with prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues. And then he goes on to say that, you know, we could give our body to be burned. We could give all our goods to feed the poor. We could sow our entire life, but without love, it profits me nothing. And as I was reading that a few weeks ago, you could turn there, 1 Corinthians 13. It talks about, I was reading it, I was, I was ironing a shirt. I was going to come to a wedding. And I felt the Lord said, get out your Bible, put it on the ironing board, and I want you to read this out loud and read it slow. And I was, I was, home, by, I was home alone. And as I was reading it, It said, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could re remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing and as I was reading that really slowly it was the last part stood out it said it profits me nothing and it, it hit me differently I was like so it's not saying that your service doesn't profit anybody it, you know it says if it doesn't have love it profits you nothing so we could work our entire life for the ministry. We could work our entire life for what we think is for God. And we could be actually helping people <laughs> the whole way. We could, we could give our, you know, all our goods to feed the poor. You know, if we give all our goods to feed the poor, that's benefiting the poor, right? The poor are being benefited. 
And we could be benefiting all these people around us and at the same time not benefiting ourselves a single bit. Now, not to be selfish, but who, who wants to work your whole life and not get, receive any benefits at all? Is it just me? Am I the only one that, you know, I'd like to receive some benefits, right? I like to see, I like to receive reward. I like to get, when I go to work, I like to get paid. And without love, it's saying it profits me nothing. We could be profiting thousands and thousands of people and not ourselves. The more excellent way. I talked about how many of us respond well if somebody comes up and just yells at us and says, with a, they're not even, we don't feel any ounce of caring toward us. And they say, you need to pray more and you need to study more and you need to change the people who you're around. And you, just, you need to make some changes. And, and they're, they're ministering this to us without love. And yet you could say the same words in a spirit of love and just and go up to somebody and say say brother you need to pray more you know you need to seek him more you need to get there's some people in your life that you need to separate yourself from you see the difference the words were exactly the same but i said it one time i said it in condemnation and judgment the second time i said it with with a heart of love and as we, you know, we're called to be ambassadors for Christ. So we're actually representing him. And I talked a lot about that the first week. I want to I show you the power that we have um, as ambassadors for Christ. You know, every one of us has heard of somebody who had a bad experience with a Christian. They got hurt by a Christian. They got hurt by the church. And now they don't want anything to do with God. And I, I started thinking more and more about that. And it's like, why do we have the power? We have the power to completely take somebody and make them not want anything to do with God for the rest of their life. That's power. Don't you think? Isn't that a powerful thing? To take somebody and... Now, now they don't want anything to do with the Lord. And the reason that that power is with us is because in their minds, we represent God. We're an ambassador. And that power, as a representative, as an ambassador, they said, if, that's, if being a Christian, if being a Christ follower is being like that guy, that ambassador, I don't want anything to do with it. And yet, in the same token... When we're walking in love, the love of Christ through us as an ambassador for Christ can trans completely transform a life and completely make somebody look at you and say, that guy, that, that Steve is following after God in such a way. And I, and I can feel the love of God coming from him. And I want to get to know the Lord. And it will open their heart up and Steve will have an opportunity to minister to them. We talked about that, that being an ambassador for Christ is a huge responsibility. I don't know how to say it any other, any other way. It's, it's a huge responsibility. The Bible says that it is as though God is pleading through us. The Lord is using our mouth and saying, be reconciled to God. You represent me. We've got to know the Lord. We have to know the love of the Father. And it's not going to come from somebody praying for you and laying their hands on you. It's a pursuit. The Lord said, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Jesus can't be our hobby. He can't be a second interest in our life. He has to be our life. In this series, we talked about the proof of our love is in the pursuit. If when I talked about when I was when I was uh, pursuing my wife and I was falling in love with my wife, and you better believe I was thinking about her all the time. 
and I was calling her. And um, I was trying to do my best to, you know, um, do whatever I could to spend more time with her. I remember she lived, she lived with her parents before we got married. We did things right. We didn't live together. She lived with her parents. I had my own place. And I would drive her down to church here. And she was in, in college studying to be uh, a physician assistant. And so she was studying all the time. And I would say, you know, what are you doing on Saturday? She's studying. You know, what are you doing this Wednesday night? Studying. What are you doing? And so I would do anything I could to try and spend as much time with her as I possibly could. When I drove her down to church, when I would drive home, I would set the cruise control at 55 just so I could spend an extra 10 minutes with her in the car. One night I called her up. I said, what are you doing tonight? Can you come over for dinner? She said, no, I have to study. I said, well, were you planning on eating today? She said, yeah, I was planning on eating today. I said, well, why don't you just come over and eat with me, and then you can just leave right away, you know? And I was pursuing her. And, that, and because I was pursuing her, she got the idea, hey, this, this guy, I think this guy really likes me. And if we're not, if we say we love God, we say, I'm a Christian, and I love Jesus, and I want, you know, I want Jesus. You know, we may even wear a cross around our neck. We might even have a necklace or something. But if we're not passionately pursuing him, I'm not sure, it's, I'm not sure that that love is really there. And this isn't condemnation. We can get this. We can get a fire for this. We talked that God is always, he's always thinking about us. His thoughts are always for us. It says that his, the thoughts that God has for us, they cannot be numbered. And also, the proof of love is giving. You know, it says that God so loved the world that he gave. What are we giving? Are we giving our time to the Lord? Are we giving our talents to the Lord? I have this, I went to a conference uh, years ago, and um, I made a, took a picture of this prayer that they gave out at the end, and I want to read it to you. And this whole conference, at the end, this brother was just talking about how the church, the church is the hope of the world. We, we are the remnant of, of, of Christ on the earth. We are his ambassadors. We represent him on the earth. And that, that the church is actually the hope of the, of the world. And there's this morning prayer. And I want to read it to you. It says, God, this is a new day. I freshly commit myself to the role that you have invited me to play as you are building your church in this world. I am awestruck again today that you would include me in this grand, life-giving, world-transforming endeavor. So today, I joyfully offer to you, Lord, my love, my heart, my talents, my energy, my creativity, my resources, my faithfulness, and my gratitude. I commit all of myself to the role that you have assigned me in the building of your church so that it may thrive in this world. And I will bring it today. Lord, I will bring my best. You deserve it. Your church deserves it. It is the hope of the world. I thought, that is, that is so awesome. And... I talked about this before too. What can we give to someone who has everything? The Lord is the creator of all things. What can we give him? We can give him our love. We can give back to him our heart, our talents, the creativity that he's given us, our energy. We can give him our faithfulness and our gratitude. Christians should be the most thankful people on earth. We should be so thankful. If we're not thankful, 
we don't understand. We don't really understand what we have. Because if you do, you will be thankful. You'll, you'll, you'll lead a life of thankfulness. We have to search with all our heart. He can't be just our hobby. Alice talked about that maturing in his love has to be a daily goal. It has to every single day wake up, put your feet on the ground, you know, and pray, Lord, today I want to mature in my love for you. Show me today, Lord. Show me today what it means to be a true man of God, a true woman of God. You heard on the, on the um, Graham Cook talking about, you know, perfect love casts out fear. His love casts out fear. Well, that word perfect is, it means mature love. So when, when our love for the Lord is mature, then when we have a true understanding of His love and who He is, then that mature, perfect love can, will cast out fear. Anytime you get afraid, anytime fear tries to come on you, this, you're, you're so mature in love, you just know who God is, and you're like, nothing can come against me. If God is for me, who can be against me? Who can separate me from the love of God? But if our love for the Lord isn't mature, if it's just a, a real shallow understanding, it's not going to cast out fear. You're still going to be afraid. So immature love does not cast out fear. Because immature love doesn't understand, truly understand its creator. But perfect love, that word complete, it means complete, completeness, a full age. Perfect, perfect love casts out fear. If we're not growing in love, then our progress is stopped. We stop progressing. Because the road is straight and it's narrow. There's few who find it. Paul said at one point, he said, there's so many great opportunities that have, and many doors that have been opened up to me. He said, but there are many enemies. Many things coming against us. And if I were, if I were your neighborhood watch director and I knew that there was somebody that moved into your town that was violent or, you know, a, a sexual predator. And they moved into your town, and I was ahead of that. And I didn't tell the neighborhood that, about this person. Would you think that was irresponsible as the, as the neighborhood watch director? It's my job to say, watch out. There's a, there's a person in here that is known to be violent, who's known to do horrible, horrible things. And my job is to, is to make you aware of that. And my job, not job, but my calling as a pastor is to let you know that there is an enemy out there. His name is, is Satan. I don't, I don't choose to talk about him too, too much all the time because... I don't like to give him a lot of my attention, but to, to, uh, to pretend that he doesn't exist and to not talk about him at all would be a great mistake. He, he is the enemy of our soul. He is the accuser of the brethren. We cannot be ignorant of his devices. We need to know that he is out there and he, is, wants to, his, he has three methods that he operates in. He wants to kill Steal and destroy. And it's real. And if we don't know that we have the best dad ever, and if we don't know that greater is he that's in us than the enemy that's in the world, we're going to shrink back. We're going to be afraid. Or even worse, you know, in this, this world, the cares of this life just choke people, their spirituality out where they don't even follow. They don't even do anything. They're not even they're not afraid of spiritual warfare. They they're not even they're not even aware that it's going on. 
but I know who I'm talking to right now. I'm talking to people here who want to, you know, that's why you're here. You, you, you signed up for a Bible school. You want to press forward. You want to seek the face of God. I want to encourage you. You have to know the love of God. You have to know how much he loves you. You have to keep pressing toward the goal and not looking back. We talked about in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror, in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And in that verse, it says, but we all with an unveiled face. And a veil is something that covers. It's something that you, you can actually hide behind. And he's saying is when we take that veil off, when we, when we stop hiding, then the Lord is able to transform us into his image from glory to glory. Not defeat to defeat, but from glory to glory. God is calling his people to come out from behind a veil and to not be afraid to let these hidden things just come out and to confess our faults one to another, that we can be healed. The body of Christ needs to be united, needs to work together. And people aren't going to confess their faults to us and they're not going to let us pray for them if they don't know that we first love them if they don't know that we have unconditional love for them. We need to walk in this, guys. We, this, is, this is serious, serious business. There's an enemy out there who is, who is stealing, killing, and destroying people every single day. It's, not a, it's no joke. It's not something I'm saying to be dramatic. It's, it's real. And the Lord has put us as his ambassadors. He said, I, I choose Eric to represent me. I choose Luke to represent me. We have to know him. We need to know that every care we have, we can cast on him. And he'll deal with it perfectly. There was a, a time about I don't know, it was a year ago, um, I was preparing to, to teach about um, praying in tongues. And as I was preparing for that teaching, I was speaking, started, you know, was doing it more and more often. And one day, I don't know if I told you this story before or not, well, I went to work and I was in this room where it was just, I was completely by myself. And I was able to pray in the spirit in tongues that day for about six hours. And um, there was just nobody around. And it was, it was just a, an incredible day. And I went home that night. And I, I just was exhausted. <laughs> and I took this short nap. And I woke up about 5.30. And my wife had made me dinner. And I went over and I sat down at the table and the presence of God was just all over me. And have you ever felt that presence? It's just so strong where it's, you're just so sensitive to anything that goes on around you. It's like you could just burst out in tears at any second. You're just, and the Lord spoke to me, not audibly, but spoke into my heart. He said, Robert, you believe that I'm a just God, right? I said, yes. He said, you believe that everything I do is fair. Everything I do is just and right. I said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are fair, and I believe that you are righteous, and I believe that everything you do is holy and right. And then I started thinking about hell. And it was just like, this revelation coming, and he said, Robert, if hell is my punishment for sin, and you believe that I'm right, you believe that everything I do is right, how serious do you 
think I am about sin. How serious do you think it is if that's the punishment for it? And it was blowing my mind. I was, just, I was just sitting there. I was like, I had tears coming down my eyes. He said, Robert, you don't see sin the way that I see sin. It's, it's a killer. It's serious. It destroys my people. It, it separates people from me. You know, Jesus said, the, the, the prince of this world is coming, but he wasn't, Jesus wasn't worried, he said, because he has nothing in me. There was nothing the enemy had where he could get a foothold in his life because he was the holy one. He was pure. And the Bible tells us that we can get to a place where the enemy just can't touch us because he has nothing in us. And I know, man, this is serious, serious stuff, and I just feel like I, I have to bring it out. It's like we are in a war, and there's a real enemy out there. And we need to focus on God because I, wanna, I don't want people going to hell. I don't want people, you know, being separated from God for all eternity. Um, Pastor Bob had a vision I don't know how many years ago it was, he saw an open vision where he, he literally looked out and he, he saw this huge pit. Then he saw people just walking and didn't even know what was going on and just falling into this pit, falling into hell. And it shook his, it rocked his whole world. And the Lord put a mandate on him that by the end of this, you know, 20 2020, that he was to rescue a million souls, a million souls. And I, I was talking with him yesterday, and I said, brother, pastor, my friend, I can't speak for anyone else, but I can speak for myself. You have, you've got yourself a partner. <laughs> I got another a partner right here. And we have to talk about this, guys, in a serious um, way like this. If the love of Christ is burning and burning in your hearts, which I pray that it is and that it will continue and will just continue to go more and more and more, we have to let that love cast out all these fears that we have. And we have to continue to press toward Him. And we have to be the best ambassadors for Him that this earth has ever seen. We need, to, we need to help rescue and pull these people out of this fire. You know, you hear this country is like obsessed with zombies. Here's all this just zombie talk and, and just, just weird stuff, crazy stuff. Well, if you think about it, this country is like a lot of walking dead. People walking around... They, they, they don't know Christ. They don't know anything about the Spirit. They're walking into this pit like Pastor Bob saw, and they're just perishing. They're, just, they're, they're dying and going to hell, and they, and they don't even know what, what happened. They're walking dead. We need to tell these people. We need to share this love. And we need to know that God judges evil because He's holy. And because he's love. I talked about it that one week. I said, you know, you ever were playing around when you were little and you're with your kids and you're having fun. And, and you just, you know, say you guys are doing, you're playing cars or Legos. And then, and then you know, Eric or Luke or Bruce comes in and does something stupid. And then mom comes in and is like, okay, that's it. Everybody's done. You know, we're taking all the cars and the fun's all over and it's all because of it's all because of Bruce, you know, and you're like, you guys are looking at him and going, Hey, what happened, man? We were having fun. Why does everything have to end just because of him? You know? And the Lord's saying, Hey, I got people on earth that call me Lord. People that are really following me. 
people who, who've, who are taking up their cross and they're following me and they believe me. I, he's not allowing, you know, a fallen angel to ruin his plan and his purpose. And he's not going to, it's not going to, he's not going to spoil it for everyone. So he's going to judge that. He's going to say, in, in God's kingdom, you know, the Bible says in Romans 8 that Christ, the law, the, the Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. He set us free. Okay, think about that for a second. Think about that real, like read that real slower. The law of sin and death. And that don't sound good. <laughs> you know what I mean? The law of sin and death. And Christ has, has made us free. And I want you to say, like, like say Eric, Eric was God, you know, and in his kingdom, there's life, peace, joy, all the fruits of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, you know, abundant joy, abundant peace, all these things. And then you have the, the enemy over here, and he's got stealing, killing, destroying, Lying, accusation. Quite a contrast between the kingdom over here of life, peace, and joy. And the, the, Jesus said, he's coming. He, he's got nothing in me. And basically, not basically, he's saying, I, I am so far from that. I am not like that. That is not me. I don't represent that. That has nothing to do with me. And that stuff is abounding on earth, and it's killing, it's destroying. And because God loves his people, he's going to judge that. He, all his judgments are because he loves us. We have to understand, this is, this is serious business. I mean, do we believe this? Do we believe that God is love? And everything he does is love. It's, you know, the word says, in him there's no darkness at all. He can have nothing to do with it. You might be wondering sometimes, you know, well, what's my calling? What, what's God calling me to do? 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that he's called us to be ministers of reconciliation. That's a calling on every single believer on the face of the earth. You are called as God were pleading through you. We need to open our mouth and tell people. We're to be the salt of the earth. What does salt do? Salt preserves. And it also makes things taste better. At least if you like salt. I, I like salt. You know, as a result of our life on earth, we should be preserving things just in our life. We should be making life taste better for everybody around us if we're walking with God. There should be, you know, the Bible talks about different aromas. The aroma of, of the Spirit and the love, you know, coming from us ought to be just a wonderful attraction. People should be attracted to us because we love. We should be making this world a better place. And like I said before, if we, if we fail to understand how much He loves us, we're not going to fulfill our destiny. I have one more scripture and then I want to I want to pray. I'm not going to go super long. I, you know, it's a pretty simple message. It's, I think you get it. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 12. 3, 12. I saw a video on this 
this week that rocked me uh, in, really, in a really good way. Talking about the judgment seat of Christ and that we're going to be judged one day for our works. In 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 12, it says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So just write those down, chapter 3, verse 12 and 15. And I'll, you can read that later when you, when you get a minute. But I want to explain to you what that means, because there's a whole lot of words there. But one day, when we go to heaven, if we go to heaven... It's because we were saved by grace, not by works. It's the blood of Christ. He, the Lord made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we would become the righteousness of God. So if we go to heaven, it's because we were born again and we had faith in the Son of God. We're saved. But then there's going to come a time where you, there's rewards Okay, so you're going to be in heaven, and then there's going to be a day of judgment where we're going to sit on the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to go through our life. And he's, we're going to sit down, and he's going to go through our day, our, our whole life, and he's going to judge it. And like in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, you know, our, what, what is going to be our motives? Without love, it profits us nothing. If we did all these things, gave our body to be burned, if we gave our life to feed the poor, but our motivation wasn't love, we're not going to get a reward for that. Um, it's going to be burned up. It says here, if anyone's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss. You'll be saved. You're, you'll be saved, but you'll still be in heaven, but you're not going to be rewarded for it. And when we know the love of Christ, we can Walk on this walk on this earth and be motivated by Christ and say, "I lead Eric to the Lord," and then Eric leads you to the Lord, and then you lead somebody else to the Lord, and and that's all coming to um, my. You know, it's like you're gonna be you're in heaven because I told you something. You know, you're in heaven because of Jesus, but you found out because of me, and my motivation was love. I'm gonna be rewarded for that. And there's going to be people in heaven who are going to sit on this judgment seat of Christ. They're in, they're in heaven. And there's going to be, you know, the Bible says that the Lord is going to wipe every tear from our eyes. Right? You've heard that scripture. Well, you say, well, in heaven there's not going to be tears. Well, why is he wiping tears from our eyes? Because I believe we're going to look and we're going to, we're going to see all the stuff, all the resources that we, you know, if we didn't, if the Holy Spirit was with us and we didn't use him as the gift and the resource that he is. We're going we're gonna to be sad about that. We're going to have regret. We're going to say, why didn't I believe the Lord? Why was I so afraid? He, 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 told, he gave me all these promises. And like I said, this is, this is just burning in my heart and I'm having a hard time with words but my heart is I want to see everyone that I know and that I love you know that's in my life that I have a direct impact on I want to see you fulfill your call I want to see you walk in love I want to see you snatching people out of the fire I want to see you sit in the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord looks at you and says, man, that, man, that Luke, he, he trusted me in every situation. 
He believed me. He, he, I called him to do this, this, and that. I called him to do scary, scary things, and he trusted me the whole way through. And that's, that's, my heart. that's what's going on in my heart right now. I just want to see the people of God rise up and walk out what they're called to do. That's all I want in my whole life. And it's a work of His Spirit because before, you know, before I got saved, I didn't, I didn't care about anybody but myself. So like I said, it's not something I can pray for you and you just receive the love of God and it's a lifelong, everyday pursuit of Him. It's a relationship. And I want to see the people that, that I know and love and the body of Christ around the world walking in that. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Lord. I thank you so much for going to the cross for us. I thank you, Lord, that you sent people in our life that told us. I even pray, I pray for every person that, that spread the word and, and told, every, told us about this, Lord, that they would be uh, energized and, and rejuvenated to continue on in the work. I pray, Father, for those who can hear me now, Lord, that you would reveal more and more of your love to us. Father, that we would, we would feel and understand the seriousness of the hour that we're living in. I ask that you would deposit in us a burning passion to be ministers of reconciliation. I thank you, Lord, for just throwing a gasoline on our fire, just... Just consume us, Lord, with the things of the kingdom. I thank you, Lord, that we would know the length and the width and the depth and the height of your love. I thank you, Lord, we would grow daily in love that any time fear would come, our love would, our love would be so mature in you that we, it would just cast it right out. We wouldn't be afraid to serve you. I thank you, Lord, for the gifts and the callings that are in this room. Thank you for a powerful work in our heart. Thank you for speaking to us in the night through dreams and visions. Thank you for prophetic words. Most of all, Lord, I thank you for the Holy Spirit revealing more and more of your love to us. Father, help us to see that one day we're going to sit we're going to sit before you and be judged lord motivate us by love that every work we do isn't even to get a reward but it's because we love you and we want you jesus to receive the fullness from the sacrifice that you made for us So burn in us, Lord, fire and passion for your name and for this world. Because you so love the world that you gave your son. So, Father, help us to yield, to be controlled by that same love that you have for the world, that it would, that love would be in us. We would take ground, Lord. We would make a difference in millions and millions of people's lives. So, Father, we say, Here we are. Send us. 
Show us what we need to do. Show us the things that we're hiding that need to come out. Show us, Father, those we can trust to confess to. Unite your church with love and mercy. The world would see Jesus when they look at us, a rescuer. I'm thanking you, Lord, for for the mercy. I thank you, Lord, even for the desire to be free from anything that would hold us back from following you. Lord, give us such a such a disdain for sin and for the things that are ensnaring us and and trapping us. Lord, we would we just want to just get rid of those things as fast as we can. I thank you, Lord, right now that you are loosening the grip of those things we can cast them on you without fear of judgment without fear of rejection we praise you Lord Father I ask that you would pour out your spirit on the earth. I ask for the greatest move of the spirit, of of the Holy Spirit that has ever been known to anyone to come in this day. Pour it out, Lord. You said that if we would humble ourselves and pray that you would heal our land, Lord. We're crying out with sober hearts. Pour out your spirit on the earth. Awaken this nation. Awaken the earth to the love of God. We're thanking you for a great awakening. The greatest awakening that has ever been seen in the history of the world. Loosed on the earth. And your people walking together, united as one. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the body. Help us, Lord, to understand. To be the part that we're called to be. Consume us. All-consuming fire. Consume us. Consume our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.